the greatest motivators we heard this years ago for prayer is answered prayer. Father, we continue to pray for each of them. We continue to pray, as Jeanette mentioned, the loss of Donna, and here's Mary with the loss of her granddad, and just so many different needs in our family, Jesus. We lift them to you. We especially think today of Pastor Dan. And Jesus, we are grateful for our church family, how they're reaching out in wonderful ways to bring meals and to keep in touch. Minister to Pastor Dan right now, we pray. Bring healing in his back, we pray. Touch him, we pray. We know that everyone's praying for him, and we just continue as a family, as a body, as the family of Harris Chapel, to pray for him. Help him to sense the prayers of God's people right now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, let's take our Bibles. Ezekiel chapter 37. I confess to you this morning, I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. If you were with us last Sunday, I preached a word and I felt like one of those cardinal batters that was out on strikes watching each of three pitches go by in the zone and I missed each one of them because I didn't swing the bat. But today I'm here to swing the bat. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37. I need the Holy Spirit. I heard a song last week. I've heard it many times before. You probably have too. Randy Travis singing about digging up bones. Anybody ever heard that song? Anybody ever felt stuck like you were digging up bones? Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, stop digging up bones, okay? I would say quit your whining, but that sounds a little bit too forward. Stop digging up bones. Randy Travis in that song was going through a dresser drawer. He was going through a closet. He was going through a jewelry box. And he kept reliving memories of a relationship that was busted, broken, and gone. She wasn't coming back. But Randy Travis couldn't get past it. He thought he could in the song, but he kept digging up bones. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, we read a prophet. And if you want to get to Ezekiel, you go to the middle, which is Psalms, and start going right. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and such, and you'll get to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is one of those prophets like the others that some people would look at him and say, you know what, he was a little bit eccentric. He was a little bit odd. He was a little bit weird. But he has in this recorded book six different visions that God gives to him over these 48 chapters. The first vision or the first part of this, the first 24 chapters, are judgment on Israel. It was not good. God was once again not pleased with his children. The second part is judgment on all the nations, verse, chapters 25 through 32. The last part where we're at today is future blessings. And I tell you this, I need the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozier said it this way, and I, I've heard it quoted anywhere from 80 to, I saw this week, 97%. A.W. Tozier said 97% of the work of the church could go on even if God withdrew his Holy Spirit, like nothing ever happened. That's an indictment on you. That's an indictment on me. I'm really looking forward to the month of August because in our study of experiencing God, Blackaby's going to really nail it about this idea that what are we doing that only can happen because God happen, makes it happen. I'll tell you why, folks. I'll confess to you this morning on my behalf and maybe even telling on us the things that we do for him, we're only doing because we're putting it in the boxes that we have it in as to we think how it should happen and how it should go. I'm going to give you a challenge at the beginning of the sermon. Maybe just say, here's the altar call right up front. What if you and I said this before we go to bed tonight and when we wake up in the morning, Holy Spirit, the only way I can do anything moving forward is if you help me do it. And don't let me do anything that you as the Holy Spirit don't help me to do. How much this week have you and I, and I just confess to you, I've, I'm, I'm busted before you this morning. I just, I feel like I need to put my hands up on the car and let you frisk me. Because the Holy Spirit has not been doing in me what this sermon has convicted me about. It is so easy for me through social media, through my own physical means, through our own creativity, even as a church sometimes, to check boxes of the things we've done, and we forget it's the Holy Spirit that's helped us do what has happened here. I remember years ago we were in a church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and 
they were celebrating an anniversary and they had that a scripture across the front that talks about hitherto has the Lord helped us. And the choir which I was directing sang that song, we've come this far, far by faith, trusting in the Lord. And we've only known at that church, and I hope in this church as well, the only way we can do what we're doing is because the Holy Spirit is helping us. And if we're doing it without his help, then we shouldn't do it. And if we do it with his help, we will do a lot more. In fact, the prayer says something about this, how he immeasurably wants to do a lot more than we ask or think. He wants to do so much more than we ask or think. I was convicted by this word this week. Let me read these verses to you, and then we'll walk through it together. It's in chapter 37 of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was upon me. This is the prophet speaking. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. It's easy for me to get caught up in doing the things I know I need to do on my to-do list to check boxes, to write it as done and completed without the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a minute and pray. Jesus, as we speak moving forward, may your Holy Spirit help us. May it not be just some frustration that a preacher harbors, or may it not be finger pointing, but may it be an examination of your Spirit speaking into us and guiding us, because just like Ezekiel said it, we say it as well, Lord, only you know. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I reached out to Deb Dulock this week. And by the way, Deb is having to babysit some dogs today and next Sunday. So she misses us and we miss her. I reached out to her when I was coming through this scripture and said, Deb, I need your help. I need you to help me. And I was saying it in a figuratively way, figurative way, channel Fritz. Help me channel Fritz on this one. She immediately sent back an email, and she was talking about, okay, here it goes. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is a new creation, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. He is in us. Galatians 6.15, we are a new creation. The writer, Ezekiel, is talking about a resurrection of Israel in a valley of dry bones. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a place of dry bones. I've been to a place of dry bones. We were on a mission trip to Sicily. And one day we went down into some catacombs. And back in that day when people died in some of these areas, instead of erecting these huge, you know, structures and monuments, they just had these places underground. And you'd be walking along and there'd be a little area to the left or the right. And there'd just be bones laying there. It wasn't even a marked grave. So I've been in a place of dry bones, and I know that when you're in a place of dry bones, ain't nothing going on. I mean, they're so old, it's been a couple thousand years for some of those bones, and there's no activity. God looks at the prophet, and he says, here's the problem. There's no activity. Israel is dead. The nations are dead. I would be concerned today to look across the landscape of our country and wonder if we are alive or if the prophet would look at us and say, y'all are doing some great things. You're building some wonderful structures. You're creating all kinds of great programs and you're helping feed people and clothe people. But you're dead. Like, really? The Holy Spirit, he said. See, the problem was it wasn't just everybody was dead. There were people living. Life was going on. Civilizations were being built. Now, obviously, there was, this was during the time of the Babylonian captivity. In fact, if I feel like I have a tough day every once in a while, I need to go back through and look at the prophets and a lot of the Bible, in fact, and realize that some of the toughest times were God were those times when God started doing the greatest work. Philippians, for instance, one of my favorite letters in the New Testament. Paul writes it from prison. Yet he says things like rejoice 
In the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But here we are, and Deb says, be reminded that we need to have God's breath in us if we really, really want to be known as his people. In fact, at the end of the Gospel of John, when he, Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room, he makes this declaration, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And in chapter 20, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. The Lord says, I will put my spirit in you. You will live. What is that spirit? It's not just kind of a happy attitude or a zeal for life. It is truly the presence of God's breath. It's his Holy Spirit. As he wanted to restore Israel, as he wanted to take out the nations who were against Israel, and he looks down through these generations, and he looks at you, and he looks at me, and he says, just like Israel, you need my breath in your life. Again, the thing that just got me so much was reading that quote from A.W. Tozer. Over 90% of the work that happens in the church today would continue without a beat, without a, without a skip, with skipping a beat, even if God withdrew his Holy Spirit. Wow. Deb shared this with me. This chapter teaches a lot of principles how God works in revival. Can I just say something about revival or camp meeting or any kind of gathering? It's not a date on a calendar. If you have a revival or a camp meeting or any other gathering, just because you're putting a date on the calendar, you're just checking a box. If you have a revival just because you like the speaker and you like the music and you like the surroundings and you like the atmosphere, then you're just checking a box. That's what God is telling Ezekiel. You're dead. And he looks at us and he says, but I want to put my Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit in us comes at that point of conversion and the point where we're saying, I need to be connected with the creator of the universe. And it continues and it continues and it continues all through life. I've known people, and you have too, even up into their 80s and 90s, the Spirit continues to fill them and they're continuing as we're studying our Sunday school class, they're continuing to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what this is about. God does want to bring a revival. It's not on the calendar. It's not in a certain place except right here in us. Deb talks about this. She said, God's servants must know that the bones are dead and dry. Have you got to that point in your life where you just lay yourself out before the Lord? That first beatitude says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that are spiritually bankrupt. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. It's not my name. It's not my accomplishments. It's not the fact that my parents were Christians. It makes no difference. He just looks down. He says, you're dead. And the first thing we need to do is recognize the bones are dead and dry. God's servant must walk among the dead. Yeah, we've got to take inventory and say, Holy Spirit, what's going on in me that should be going on because you want to be at work in me? God's servant must proclaim God's word. God's servant must have an almost foolish confidence. I like this. A foolish confidence in the word of God. God's servant must understand that the spirit works in a process. God's servant must recognize that the Holy Spirit working in our lives is essential. If I don't have it, I'm not going to make it. Have you got to that point yet? Jesus, if I don't have your Holy Spirit, I am dead. I am dry bones. A lot of dry bones in our world, folks. God's servant must notice every evidence of the Spirit's work. God's servant must look for God's people to be revived in an army of service. God's servant must say, hope is always at work. We're never going to lose hope because the Spirit whether it's the children of Israel, this is the last part of Deb's writing here, whether it's the children of Israel or the saints of the church today, it's us, folks. It's us that the Holy Spirit wants to work through. The Holy Spirit will not sanctify this pulpit. The Holy Spirit will not sanctify these pews or these walls or these grounds. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. The Holy Spirit fills you. Now, I know there are times that we come to this way. The, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can, you know, we, we just know that his presence is here because of you. Yes. You know, when I come over here on Sunday mornings and go through the sermon and pray and just take some time and reflect and ask the Lord to help us, it's empty. It's empty. 
Sometimes it's pretty boring because it's just me. But when you come in here and you're on the same mission that I'm on and you're saying, hey, Holy Spirit, we need you to help us, then something will start to happen. Something will start to happen. And that's what took place in Ezekiel's day when the Lord said, talk to these bones. Preachers, every Sunday we're talking to some dry bones. And sometimes the sermon is this. You may get a little bit out there, but a lot of it's coming in here today, okay? I was in, in Iowa. We were associates up there, and, and in that sanctuary, it had 60 pews, 20, 20, 20. It could hold five, 600 people in the sanctuary. I was the associate of youth and worship. One Sunday, the pastor, he preached an excellent message. His name was Don Scarlett, missionary to South Africa, and he was a great preacher. And a layman, I was standing in the foyer after the service, and one of the laymen came and said, Pastor, he said, he, he was one of these guys that sat near the back. He said, man, he said, that was a hard sermon. He said, yeah. He said, I realized it was pretty tough. He said, no. He said, you know what was hard? He said, everybody in front of me was just shoveling it over their shoulder, and it was all hitting me on the back pew. Don't shovel the sermon today, okay? Listen carefully. Because just as the Lord came to Ezekiel, he's coming to Jim, and he's coming to you, and he's saying, you don't want to be dry bones anymore. And this is not just a preacher word. This is a word for each of us. Sunday school teachers, home group leaders, we have a sacred trust just like I do. I don't get up here and, oh, every once in a while I try to be funny and say some off-the-cuff stuff. But nothing that would, that would go against the character of Scripture, the character of the Holy Spirit. And the same thing is true for us as teachers, Sunday school teachers and home group leaders. We, we have a sacred trust. This church is you, this church, are a sacred trust. And we need the Holy Spirit. I think about people that are teaching our children. I think it's next week or so we're going to have Sunday school. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have promotion. And we need to pray for the teachers as well as the students. What a great thing. You know, there are people that will, will chase all over the country for sports, and I have nothing against sports. My dad was a basketball coach. I was born on the night of a basketball game. Mom had to drive herself to the hospital because dad was coaching a basketball game. So I know about sports. It started when I was this big. So I'm just telling you this, that I've, I've seen that. But chasing sports will not raise dry bones being involved in all kinds of activities and doing great things for our kids and spoiling them with all these phones and tablets and cars and everything else will not raise dry bones. Ezekiel just looks, and it's almost like he's trying to defer a little bit or hide like Moses with the stumbling tongue thing. Lord, only you know. But in that moment, Ezekiel said something that was so profound because the Lord does know. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I will cause breath. It's the ruah. It's the Spirit of God. We're not talking about resuscitating someone who's, who's, who's maybe had the breath knocked out of them or needs some CPR. We're talking about the Spirit of God in a person. In my vision, Ezekiel says, as I preached, there was a noise, a rattling, and these bones came together. See, that, that excites me. I've had the privilege for about a dozen years now to to be there for the basketball team and to pray with them before all the games and home games and away games and after season, whatever games, whatever the sectional and stuff like that. And, and I always consider that a privilege, but something got me this week where I saw some dry bones getting some breath in them. Last Sunday, one of our boys, I'm not sharing anything off the record here because it was on Facebook, and when it's on Facebook, the whole world knows. Nate Nelson, great kid, graduated this year. I saw he got baptized last week. I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled. I didn't take credit for that. I might have had a small piece there. But then there's Craig Standish who keeps the books and others who are other Christian parents of these different kids who are right there. And sure enough, Nate got baptized. And he's like, I, I reached out to him and I messaged him. And I said, I said, Nate, this is exciting. This is awesome. He says, Pastor, all I can say is the Holy Spirit came into me. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It wasn't a gym thing. It was the Holy Spirit thing. It was Craig Standish and others. Every, it, was like, it was like when John Wooden says, when the ball goes through the hoop, ten hands put it there. So all the hands, and you guys put it there too. You sponsor the ball team and different things. Like, you, put that, you put that kid through the hoop. That, he, he's there. He says, all I can say is the Holy Spirit came in my life. 
That is thrilling. That's what we're reading about here. We're surrounded by all kinds of dry bones. Boats come up and down the, the road here. Oh, I look at some of those boats and I, I nearly covet, okay? I ain't going to say I covet, but I get pretty close. I can see covet from my front porch, all right? But I also understand that sometimes that's just dry bones up and down the road. Runners and bikers and swimmers and all kinds. It can just law enforcement and even churches. We don't want to be dry bones. What a miracle this was. And sure enough, he goes on, and I, I love what he says, I will put my breath in you. That's the Ruach, the breath of God. You will come to life, and you will know that I am the Lord. As you go to bed tonight, as you get up to morning, in the morning, what about just asking that question? Holy Spirit, are you going to help me do what I need, even to get my feet on the floor and start this day? Holy Spirit, I need your help. I don't want to be dry bones. In the New Testament, there's a story that goes right hand in hand with this. You know the story. It's a guy named Lazarus. And Lazarus was dead. Jesus knew it. The disciples knew it. Mary and Martha knew it. And Jesus comes on the scene in John, I think it's about chapter 11 or so. And Jesus knows Lazarus is dead. Everybody knows he's dead. And Jesus says, your brother will live again. And they look at him and they say, okay, we understand. I mean, in their minds, they were saying, that is such a dumb thing to say. But on the outside, they, they make that comment that just kind of glosses, yes, Lord, we know in the resurrection, he'll be there again. It's all, we'll, we'll, we'll all be together by and by. The circle won't be unbroken. going to be okay. And then Jesus looks and he says, no, wait a minute. You need to hear this, Jesus says. I am Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. He just lays the groundwork. And in the Old Testament, God is laying the groundwork through Ezekiel saying, no more dry bones. I'll put my breath in you. I believe God needs people who are willing to let his breath live in them. Yes. Not some kind of res resuscitation. I'm talking about being transformed, yes. being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus looks at him and he says, okay, yes, I'm the resurrection of life. The person who believes in me, even if they die, Anyone who's alive and believes in me will never die. And then he looks at them and he says, do you believe this? I think every preacher somewhere in the sermon, probably right before the altar call, we ask ourselves the question, do people believe what's being said right now? Do you believe this? Ezekiel in the Old Testament, John, Jesus in the New Testament. See, Martha was so wrapped up in the sorrow that she could have missed out on the miracle. I don't want to get lost in that. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I have a tough time. I love my dad very much. We were all about basketball. We were all about a former uh, baseball team known as the St. Louis Cardinals. Let's let that sink in for a minute. They're now, all have been sent down to the minors. I told my mom this week, I said, Mom, I know that teams trade players all the time. Couldn't we trade management? You know, we're going to let you go. We're going to send you on to the Dodgers, and we'll take their coach or whoever, management. But anyway, that's not part of this sermon. I miss my dad. There are some times, uh, the, other, the other day I had a shirt of his. It said Bob Ballinger, Central, uh, it was the Central Missouri Bassmasters uh, Bass Club he was a part of. I put on that shirt and wore it up to the hospital to see Bobby Adams. I was channeling Dad walking into the room. I thought anything to cheer up Bobby Adams. I think if I hear right, he got to go home yesterday. So, so, so I, I just think about it. I miss my, and I, I told that to mom one time, missing dad. And she goes, you got to stop this. This is my mom, married nearly 67 years to dad, 10 days short of 67 years. She got to stop that. I'm like, what, mom? I, I, she goes, your dad's in heaven. I'm like, that's right, mom. Thank you for reminding the preacher that his dad's in heaven. I need that. But I, we need to realize that. And we, re, we need to make sure people around us know that we don't have to live dry bones lives. We don't have to do that. That's what Ezekiel is saying here. There is breath that God wants to put in us. I love it where Jesus just looks at him. He says, he's not dead. Take away the stone. And sure enough, this smelly dead body comes back to life, wrapped up in cloth, and everybody is shocked. Now, sure enough, later on down the road, Lazarus did die. As my buddy Rick Kaufman says, none of us are going to get out of this alive. I just don't want to be dry bones. 
I want to be ready. I want to be like the guy who says, I don't want to get to heaven somehow. I don't want to make it by the skin of my teeth. He says, I want to be in a dead sprint so that when I get across the finish line in heaven, I'm going to have to have like a couple hundred yards just to slow down when I get in there. See, here's the deal. As Ezekiel was talking and sharing this vision, it not only happened B.C., but it happens today as well. That God looks around, especially to us as a church, because that's what Jesus was talking about, and says, no dry bones. No corpses in the building. So much more. As we go today, I want to ask you that question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, that he wants to put his Holy Spirit in you? Jim, I don't feel like it today. It's not about feelings. Faith and feelings are two separate things, way separate things. It's not about a feeling. It's a trust. It's saying, I don't want dry bones. I need the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you a handout here in a few minutes after we pray at the altar, but I want to get to that. This handout has some ways in Ezekiel 37 that we can see the Holy Spirit benefits of the Holy Spirit in your life. I don't want to leave you without tools. Every week in our Sunday school class, we give out a half sheet of tools. It's a toolbox class. We walk through the Beatitudes. I don't, want, I don't want people just to come and just say, oh, that was nice. Nice day, nice weather, temperature was okay, lighting was fine, case did super. I'm not, it, it's, we got to take stuff that is going to, through the week, not allow us to be dry bones. The Holy Spirit seeks to bring greater glory to the Lord through every believer. The Holy Spirit intercedes for believers in ways that he pleads our concerns to the Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of guilt. These are all based on scriptures. The Holy Spirit guides believers into the truth. Looking for truth in all the right places? Think about that. The Holy Spirit comforts us in times of affliction and hardship. The Holy Spirit cleanses, sanctifies, justifies. I am so grateful I don't have to carry around the burden of sin anymore. There's an empty cross, there's an empty tomb, and the Holy Spirit wants to fill my lungs with himself. The Holy Spirit restrains evil. The Holy Spirit refreshes us daily with hope and love. The Holy Spirit regenerates. The Holy Spirit reminds us of important truths that we forget. Remember those people at the empty tomb? They were all worried about what happened to Jesus. There it is. The Holy Spirit shows up. Might have been an angel. Might have been a, I don't know, some anonymous gardener. Or Jesus himself reminds us of important truths. And the last thing is the Holy Spirit helps us prioritize. I don't know what your to-do list looks like. I don't know what your daily planner looks like. I got one of those things at the beginning of the year. You can plan out every day. You can plan out every hour of every day. But the question is this. Is the Holy Spirit engaged in your life to do that stuff? Because if you're doing that stuff with the half the Holy Spirit, we're nothing more than a tinkling cymbal or some kind of gong. The Holy Spirit puts flesh, as we read further in this story, on those dry bones. And more than anything, he puts his breath in you and me. Let's stand together this morning. And Lorraine, would you mind just coming to play something for a moment? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to invite you to come and pray with me. You know, I'll be the first one here. I need the Holy Spirit. And before we leave, we'll give these to uh, maybe Greg, if you could take these to the back as we get ready to go, and you can grab those on the way out, people. But I want to just ask you to come this morning. If you want to join me in prayer and just say, Jim, I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to know that I don't have all the answers. I need to know that without the Holy Spirit, I'm just dry bones. And Jim, I don't want to be dry bones anymore. Jim, I know for revival to happen, it's going to have to be the Holy Spirit. It won't show up on the calendar. It won't be at a specific location except my heart and my mind and my life. That's why we, some people ask me, I had a great conversation with a guy this week. Name was John, girlfriend April with him said he had a lot of questions. Who are, what, what's this church about? What, who are you people anyway? Can I just tell you, if anybody asks you, we're a church that believes Ezekiel 37. The Church of the Nazarene, specifically Harris Chapel, we believe Ezekiel 37, that we're not dry bones, that the Spirit of the living God is in our lives. Jesus asked, do you believe this? Jesus, in prayer this morning, I say with a resounding, yes, 
I believe this. Jesus, I need the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I need the focus, the microscope, the telescope, whatever that scope is, the binoculars. I need it turned away from me and turned on you. Jesus, I don't want to be dry bones. Jesus, I don't want to be just doing my thing and asking you at the end of the day or the end of the week to just kind of put a little bow on it or a stamp of approval. Jesus, I need your Holy Spirit. Oh, may it be so today, Jesus. I pray it for myself and and I want to get just a little bit personal and not just for myself, but everybody who's here today listening to this sermon, Jesus. The trophies, the medals, the accolades, they all end up in the trash someday. But what ends up in heaven, Lord? It's a heart that has been filled with the Holy Spirit. As these words say from the song, Holy Spirit, be my guide. Holy Spirit, illumine my heart, my life. Holy Spirit, change me. Holy Spirit, cleanse me. Holy Spirit, forgive me. Holy Spirit, use me. Use me, Holy Spirit, for the glory of God, I pray. And Father, for others who are here at the altar today that are praying that prayer that say, we don't want to be dry bones. We want to be filled with the very breath of God. I pray that it would be so. I pray that as we leave this sanctuary today, there would be a lift. There would be a lift not just because the preacher didn't want to strike out, but there would be a lift because the Holy Spirit shows up. There would be a lift because we need you, Jesus. And we're going to go in your power. And as we get ready for bed tonight, we're going to say, Holy Spirit, help me reflect on this day and ask, did I do that with your help or did I just do it on my own? And as we begin tomorrow, say, Holy Spirit, I don't want to do anything today that will not reflect you and be filled and used by you even changing lanes on the highway, even coming to a four-way stop, even being stalled in traffic because of construction. Oh, Jesus, help us. Lord, we want your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. May it be so. May it be so in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.